lot of comments about the coaches need to develop the players. That's where it boils down to, Mark. And, and, all right, I'll say this. I'll say this. There is a percentage of it going both ways. There is a percentage. Um, but I think it's different at Miami because Miami can't afford to. If we do bring in a quality coach, it's hard for us to hold on to him or multiple coaches. Okay. Yep. So the tough part in that is you bring in these talented young men. And in this book I'm reading, uh, Above the Line from Urban Meyer, amazing book. Any at, Anybody who wants to learn leadership or coaching, please. There's an ebook on it. I think it's like 99 cents for the ebook. Listen to it. Great book. In one of the lines, he was talking about how uh, at Ohio State, they were playing UAB. I think it was 2013. Close game. Down to like the wire. Um, and a team that was favored by 23 points. And yes, it was a young team. Lost a lot to the NFL. Um, 2012. Miller, yep. uh, huh? 2012. Yep. Okay, 2012. Braxton Miller. His first team. Taken. His first uh, team. team. Yep. Uh-huh. Urban Meyer's first team at Ohio State. Yes. So he ends up breaking this huge touchdown and they end up winning the game, I think, about 14 points or so. 29-15. Yep. <laughs> I remember scores to games. So just keep going. Yep, I remember okay. it well. Okay. So uh, in, the, in the paragraph now, he talks about the fact that him making that play had nothing to do with the scheme. Him doing that play had nothing to do with the crowd, the fans. It was the fact that a good player made a great a great player made a great play at the time that you needed it to. And the job of coaches is to be able to get these great players to play great at almost all times. And even when they're not playing at their best, be able to make up for it with the scheme or be able to make up for it with leadership and things like that. That's where he was going with it. And I never thought about it like that because, of course, the, the argument at Miami is always, oh, we're talented, just blame the coaches. Or then the other argument is, these coaches aren't so bad. The players suck. You know, there has to be an understanding that there is a percentage that goes both ways. And, yeah, there's a little slanted to the talent side at the University of Miami, a private institution who doesn't care about his football program, who doesn't want to invest in his football program. It's a little harder for them to bring in the coaches that can do that. Uh, So we have to recruit like this and hope that we can hold on to developers. It is great to have Uncle Lou in the uh, live chat. I don't know if he's still here, but uh, for any who don't know, Uncle Lou's got a great YouTube channel talking college football all the time himself. So Uncle Lou makes a point here that leads me to something that I said several days ago when asked a question. And here's the deal. If you go to any first-rate program in the country, I don't think you're going to find a list of coaches over the last 20 years that have accomplished less than Miami head coaches. So this is this is the point. Miami, since Butch Davis, even beginning with Larry Coker, even though he won a national championship at Miami, what did he accomplish anywhere else? Nothing. So basically, Mark Richt is the one coach who's been hired in the last 20 years, who has shown himself to be capable anywhere else, has done anything on the head coaching level anywhere else. And unfortunately, because we know of the decisions that he made as head coach, and also he probably would have been a much better coach five to 10 years later with a little bit more fire in his belly at Miami. So he was a capable hire and things went off the rails for other reasons. But he was the one capable guy that proved that he could win big somewhere else. But every other coach that they've hired before and after Miami never showed that they could win at a high level at a Power 5 school. Mm -hmm. I think there's something to be said that they haven't hired well. You know, Mark, for you to be a... uh a big, you know, the voice of college football. I think you got a good grasp of Miami. I remember about a year ago, you made a video that, like, I mean, numbers were out of this room. And um, the first time, like two years ago, you made, like, kind of a jabby video. We, we, it, it was, yeah, it was facts, but it, it was pretty harsh in the way that you said what you said. And then last year, 
you made one that just kind of broke it down as to, I mean, I think you even went into like winning percentage of coaches and rankings and that classes, you know, what their official ranking was at the end, after four years, how many games each class won, all that type of stuff. You went like really in depth. And that one had a, a way better response because you explained the, the issues. When I come on and I speak about this institution, I don't go there. Um, I don't work there yet. Um, I just hope that the right people get a glimpse of what the problem is. And I don't know where you find the money. I don't know if you magically get, you know, some big time donor to drop a whole bunch of money. But you got to realize that you got to play the game. You look at some of these big time institutions. Yeah, they're public. I get it. They're public. So they get they get all type of money from the state to run their institutions so their other money can be ventured into athletics. But when you talk about how this athletic program was built, was built, the, the whole school, for the most part, Mark, of what you see down there in Coral Gables at the University of Miami right now, was built off of the backs of our athletes on that football field. Black, Hispanic, white, whatever. Our players built that. And they never handed the money back to football. And I don't know how they do it. Maybe it's to UM Athletics and you write out a check. And everybody has to get even amount of money. But if football goes out and wins the games that they do, the championships that they have, Football should get majority of the money put back into them because you get out what you put in. So if I keep giving you pennies, eventually it's going to take me a lot longer to get to a dollar instead of me just keep giving you back your dollar or give you five or give you 10 and give you 20, give you more of an incentive to get better and better and better. It, it just, I don't, I could go on a long soliloquy about it. I just really hope that moving forward, the, the institution, because I think that the staff, especially Coach Manny Diaz, wants to be great, but he has to go ask the board of trustees, can I get a little bit more this time? Uh, you helped me get the offense. I was able to bring in a quality offense, a former OC at wide receiver coach, something we haven't done. We haven't done stuff like that to where quality coaches come in and be just a position coach, Mark. The last time we did that was Kuligowski. and see what that defensive line did. All four were drafted. All four were in the NFL. Who started for him? Okay. Now he has to go back and ask if he can do the same thing for defense or if he can do it for just um, just assistant coaches, quality coach. Even if he goes in, let's say, for example, he wants to go bring in a big-time D.C. Well, Mark, you can't do that with $1.2 million contract. You, you're not going to make nothing shake like that, Mark. You would have to go get a young up and comer or promise a position coach to come be your coordinator and hope that it works. It's very simple. If it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. So put money into it and it will come back. I promise you. You know, take a chance. Why not? You took 20 years off not doing it. Well, you never really did it. So just take a chance. How about you dedicate 10 million, 10, 15 million? Go get a nice staff and let's see what happens.